John chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Here we go. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. We don't know exactly which feast. The Bible doesn't tell us. Jesus would partook in at least three Passovers. So he would have been involved in other, in other feasts. I don't mean to go off and do too much teaching. But, you know, there were three various feasts that were required by the Jewish men in the Old Testament to, to, to go on a pilgrimage towards Jerusalem to worship the Lord. Because that's where the temple of God was, which represented where the presence of God was. And they were to go on a pilgrimage at least three times a year. And Passover was one of those. Also, Feast of Tabernacles was one of those. And we're also I also have a scripture in here about the Feast of Tabernacles. And, you know, the point is, is that they would just go to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. Now what we do is we come to church on Sunday, on Sundays and Wednesdays. And the reason that we do that is to worship the Lord. It's not a set of rules and regulations. You get the privilege to worship the God of glory. That's how they were supposed to look at it. They were supposed to look at it like, hallelujah, it's Passover. Yeah, I got to walk through a mountainous terrain. I got to go through valleys. There's going to be danger. There's going to be rock. There could be robbers hiding in the crags of the rock. But hallelujah. I get an opportunity to pilgrimage towards Jerusalem to be in the presence of the Lord and to and to worship him. Yes, Amen. Yes. So neither rain nor snow nor sleep is going to keep you out of the house of God. All right. Amen. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a Jerusalem by the translation says sheep market. There wasn't really a sheep market, but there was a sheep gate. So the translators put market in there. But the idea is, is that there were 12 gates that surrounded Jerusalem. There was a big old wall that surrounded Jerusalem, and there were various gates. And through the sheep gate is where the sheep that were brought into the city of Jerusalem for the purpose of sacrifice were brought in there. And through, Jesus said, I am the door to the sheep. No man comes to the yes. Father but by me. He's the entryway. He's the only open way. He's the only way that you can access the presence of That's God. Right. But it's interesting to me that in this little story that we're going to talk about this morning, that by this sheep gate where the sacrifices were brought in, there was also a pool that represented a pool of healing. It says right here that by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda. It had five porches around it. And in these porches around this pool lay a great multitude of impotent folk. They had no strength in them. They were weak. They were frail. They lay there. They were blind. They could not, many of them were blind and could not see. They were halt. They were withered. Mm -hmm. The idea behind withered, it says there was no juice. Mm -hmm. In medical terminology today, we use the word atrophy. Mm -hmm. Their muscles had been out of use for so long that all the juice had dried up. They couldn't even move their, their limbs anymore. To, to be able to, they couldn't do anything for themselves. They were, they were without strength. Let me tell you something. There's a, peer, there's a picture being displayed here spiritually about the spiritual yeah, condition yeah, sure. of the human heart. Listen, before Jesus shows up and fills you up, you cannot see the things of God. The word of God says that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Listen, when you're born again, all of a sudden God will open your eyes to things that you never even knew existed. You know, you're not the only one there's somebody else in this place this, this morning, and it's not important who it is, but I was out on the street witnessing, and I handed him a track, and I said, I was talking to him, and I could tell, and I said, hey, you never heard of Adam before. Listen, he said, no, we're living in the midst of a society where things are so different today than they were ever before. Back in the day, even if you didn't know the Lord, you still knew the Lord was real. You still knew that he existed, and what we believed was that there was a God in heaven, and the God that we talked about was the one that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin but we live in the midst of a darkened society and it's not important how it got this way but it's because of evil spirits, it's because of the plan of Satan, it's because of the deception that has entered the church, it's because of the deception that has gotten behind pulpits and has prevented preachers from telling the truth because out of fear of their heart they're scared somebody's not going to come back and sit in a chair next week and write their tithe and put it in the bucket but I'm here to tell you, that's not what God called us to do, is to make money for the kingdom. God called us to bring souls into the kingdom. And I just believe that if we would do what God's called us to do, then his people, hallelujah, will be humbled by him. And that they will support the work because they'll understand that if the gospel goes forward and changes people's lives, I'm being part of that. 
Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. That's why I keep trying to tell you, look, I don't mean to get off on a rabbit trail. Give to the work in Mexico because I'm telling you, God's doing something supernatural yes. over there. And when you give to the kingdom and the work of God, hallelujah, you're part of hallelujah. what God is doing. Amen. They're blind, they're halt, they're withered, and they would wait for the moving of the water. The idea was, was that they thought they felt like an angel would come and stir the water. And for one moment in time, while the water was moving, it says that whoever was the first one in there, after the water was troubled, that they would be healed. But then after that, there was no more. You see, I want you to understand something that before Jesus, there's only limitation. Come on now. Yeah. Before Jesus enters into your life, there's only limitation. That's good. That's good. Look, the world oftentimes means well. As we hear this conversation that Jesus has with this man, we're going to understand that even the people around him did not want to help him because they were more concerned about their own situation and about their own lives than they were to help another person. At the same time, we live in a society where man wants to help man. Listen, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't come here to preach on this, but the Tower of Babel, the same spirit lives today. The Bible says that God told them to spread out over the earth and that they would create nations. And the reason why was because it was always God's plan that from every tribe, tongue, and nation, there would be people that would be born into the kingdom that would celebrate and serve the king of glory. But under the leadership of Nimrod, instead of doing what God told them to do, they said, let come, let us come ourselves together. Let us build ourselves a city. Let us build ourselves a tower. Let us make bricks. Let us rise up. Let us build ourselves a tower that will rise up into the heavens. Man helping man. Man with his own plan. Man creating a society void of the plan or the will of God. We live in the midst of that today. The music industry tells of the message. Hollywood tells of the message. Psychology tells of the message. AA tells of the message. I'm here to tell you everything's contrary to the ways of God. There's one step to freedom. There's one step to liberty. His name is Jesus. Jesus. He shed his blood, and if you put your hope and your trust in him, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit will flow in your life, and he will do a work that nobody else can do. Man can't help you unless he leads you to Jesus. He will try. He will try to help you. He will try to do everything that he can do. And I'm not even saying that you don't have to go through it on your own to experience it for yourself, to come to the right conclusion when it's all said and done, that it's Jesus that you need. Yes. 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 <laughs> I used to preach against people taking their medicine. I used to preach against people. To, listen, I don't preach that. No, you got to do what you feel is right for you. But when it's all said and done, don't ever forget what the preacher said. The medicine cannot heal you. Right, right. The psychiatrist. Jesus! Yeah. Everything else is a band-aid that's trying to cover up a cancer. But what I'm trying to say is that Jesus can reach deep down inside the marrow of your bones. Yes. You know, your bones have marrow, and marrow produces red blood cells, and red blood cells have hemoglobin, and hemoglobin carries oxygen, and it releases oxygen at the cellular level, and it gives life to the physical body. Yes. Hallelujah! Yes. Jesus is like marrow for your spiritual bones. On, yes. Though you look like you were dead, he will rise you up. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. He will give you strength. Hallelujah. He will give you life. Yes, he will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They were impotent. They were blind. They were halt. They were withered. And they would wait for the moving of the water at a certain season. Because after it was troubled, the first one in, he would be healed. He'd be made whole. But it was limited. And whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time. I just want to make a point. It's probably even one of my points in my message, but I wanted to say something. Jesus knew. Jesus knows where you are, man. Yes, That's right. Does. Jesus has been knowing where you've been. He's not blind to that. The word this morning that Sabrina, that the Lord gave through Sabrina says that I'm with you. You're not alone. His arms are wide open and he's beckoning you. He's calling you. He's imploring you to come to him. He wants you to know that the enemy would lie to you and he would whisper lies to you and he would tell you that you're alone and that it's hopeless and that you're without help. But he's a liar. 
Don't get mad at me if I get happier, excited about Jesus. Come on, somebody. And like, I remember, you know, people come, come to the church. First time they come to the church, put on Facebook. I ain't going to no church where the preacher yells at me. <laughs> ain't nobody yelling at you, man. Come on. I'm excited about Jesus. Right. Hope I don't ever have false teeth, man. <laughs> Jesus knew that this man had been that way for a long time. In that case, he said unto him, will you be made whole? Yes. The impotent man answered him, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step is down before me. Excuses. Excuses and limitations. It can't get where I got to get because nothing's going my way. Right, right. But even bigger than that, come on somebody, listen to the way, we ain't got there yet, it's one of my points. It's not just an excuse because it's not all his fault, because remember, he's, he's blind, he's hulk, yeah. he's, yeah. he's withered. Yeah. He's withered, man, he's been this way for 38 years, his spiritual muscles are atrophied, he ain't got no juice left, he can't get himself where he needs to get, he can't get into the pool on his own, he needs somebody to help him. <laughs> He says unto him, Jesus saith unto him, verse 8, Rise, take up your bed and yes. walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews, therefore, they're talking about the religious leaders, said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful. For you to carry your bed. See, that is the lie of religion. Come on now. Yeah. If you don't do things the way they want you to do things. Now listen, let's not get crazy and start taking stuff out of context and right. think we can do whatever it is. The Word of God is written. The Holy Spirit gives revelation regarding the Word of God. Yeah. What we need to understand, the, the Word of God doesn't change. We can't start taking stuff out of context. And yeah, don't get me wrong now. God will do things that we don't necessarily expect. God does things differently than what our mind is expecting many times. But what God does operates and lines up according to his word. But what I will tell you is this, is that whenever something is done outside of the norm of what people think religion is supposed to look like, it starts to fluster religious feathers. Even in the modern church today, let me tell you something. I know I've experienced it. I've been on boards and churches that were in the assemblies of God. I've had conversations with preachers. I'm not going to sit here and name it all out. That's not even really what it's all about. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that I know for a fact that when you start telling the truth, now maybe it's, you know, Matt, the problem is, is that you just got a, you got a personality that ruffles people's feathers. That's probably true. <laughs> and I need God to work on me if that's getting in the way of God's work. Lord, please work on me. There's a lot of truth to that. But what I will tell you is that even if you remove Matt's personality from the equation, people got a problem when you start operating in a way that's contrary right. to the traditions that they've always operated in. Yeah. We don't do it that way anymore, preacher. We don't do it that way anymore. We don't just bring, you know, anyway, I don't want to get into all that. All I'm trying to say is this, is that whenever you start going in a way that's different than what people expected you to go, it irritates them. I'm here to tell you, yeah. Jesus is the Sabbath. Yeah. See, many times people think that, oh, you didn't show up on Sunday or you didn't show up on Wednesday and preachers will preach that kind of thing. Well, you didn't show up on Sunday. You missed the Sabbath. No, that's listen. I'm not trying to pick on the preacher because I probably would have said that before, too. But that's not even the truth of God's word. I want you here on Sunday. Amen. Please come on Sunday. And thank you for coming in the rain, by the way. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. But let me tell you something. That is not the truth. The truth is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. God the Father rested on the seventh day when his work was complete. And it was all foreshadowing a day. Listen, the book of Hebrews even talks about the fact that had Joshua given them rest. Because the psalm talked about it later. Had Joshua given them rest. In other words, had them entering into the promised land been the rest that God was talking about to begin with, then he wouldn't have spoke. The psalmist wouldn't have spoke of another rest to come. Yeah, wow, that's good. The book of Hebrews says that in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, there's, a, there's another rest to come because there's a spiritual rest that's found in Jesus. 
I'm talking about a spiritual peace. Yeah. No man can give it. No man can take it away. Yeah. Jesus is the Sabbath that your heart has always longed for. But what they did was is that they came upon the earth. They start twisting, tearing, and changing the scriptures to meet their own needs. Because in mankind, religious leaders want to be elevated. They want power. Right, right. Jesus said in the book of Revelation, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Nico means control. Laity means the people. I hate a doctrine that controls the people of God. Let me tell you something. There's a spirit of control behind many pulpits that want to make people feel less than for whatever reason. They don't want people going where the true word of God is being preached, whatever that may be. And there's always a spirit that's behind it that's trying to hinder you, to prevent you, whether it's keeping your eyes sleepy so you don't wake up on Sunday morning or you go into another church and, and, and you know, and it's and, and it just, it's just this control spirit behind it that prevents people from moving out and experiencing the truth of God's word that will set them at liberty. Yes. Amen. Yes, God has a plan to Hallelujah. set people at liberty. He said, Amen. and so the Jews therefore said unto him, that was cured. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. So there's our story. You know, the Bible's filled with countless stories like this. Yeah. Of people who were hindered by their weaknesses and their infirmities, which prevented them from moving forward with their lives one way or another. I mean, if you've ever taken the time to read the Bible cover to cover, you will see story after story, life after life of people being hindered, whether it was weakness, whether it was sickness, whatever it was, hindered from moving forward in the things of God. I can remember uh, uh, not long ago I mentioned Naaman the leper. Y'all remember that? I don't know if I mentioned it or if I actually preached on him. But Naaman was a mighty man in the book of in the, in the Kings. Uh, he was a Syrian general. The Bible says he was a powerful man. He was a noble man. The idea was that, is that he had money. But then it said, but he was a leper. Mm -hmm. Leprosy dirt in the Bible always represents sin. And leprosy would cause people to be social outcasts. Right. I've said it before, but they would have to walk around on the street. They would have to cover themselves up. And they would have to scream, unclean, unclean. At least if they were Jewish, because according to the Jewish law, if you touched a person with leprosy, you were made unclean. Now, could you imagine having to live your life that way? Every day, walking around, having to warn people that you were unclean because it was. Come to find out, we know now leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease, is actually a bacterial infection. That's why you don't see it anymore because it can be treated. Right. But they didn't know that back then. So it was contagious. You know, sin can be contagious. Right. You sit too close to a leper. Guess what? You're going to start getting leprosy. That's why I'm trying to tell you right now that the word of God is real clear. Come out from amongst them, says the Lord. Be ye separate. For what fellowship does light have with darkness? You, you Listen to me. You cannot fellowship with darkness. You cannot sit close to leprosy and not think that it will not get on you and it will not contaminate you. I didn't write the word of God. I'm just trying to tell you what it says. Hallelujah. And if it offends someone to hear that, then they're being offended by the lies of Satan and not by the word of God. Because God's word, yes, it can be an offense and it can be a stumbling block, but its ultimate purpose is always to heal. God's plan and his purpose is always to heal. Come out from amongst them, says the Lord, and be ye separate. So Naaman was a leper, but God delivered him. I can remember not that long ago. When I studied about the Samaritan woman, I was just trying to think of some different people real quick in my head when I was writing my introduction. Some different people that had been, that had been hindered and in, in the Samaritan woman in my mind. And I remember when I studied about her the first time, I learned so much, man. I used to, man, I used to study so deep. <laughs> one layer after another layer after another layer. And one of the things that I learned, it says that it was the sixth hour. And according to Jewish time, that was 12 o'clock noon. It was the sixth hour when she went to go get that water. She was at the well, it seems as though, all by herself. Perfect timing for an encounter with Jesus. <laughs> you know Jesus knows how to get you alone? Yeah. When you need him most, he knows how to get you in a spot where he will show up and he'll have a conversation with you. Yeah. But you know, there are, and that's one of the things that I like to learn about context, because context is so important. I've tried to teach y'all that. 
Context is so important. And you know, there have been ancient documents that have been uncovered. You can do research on various things if you really care to try to learn some things. And one of the things that, that, that scholars are pretty certain of is that, is that drawing water was a chore that was done typically by women. You can even see that in the ancient story of Jacob. Uh, I'm sorry, not Jacob. Um, whenever uh, Abraham sent Eleazar to go fetch a wife. Boy, that's a good story right there. Gentile bride. I'm not a Gentile bride, but a bride for his son. But anyway, it's another story. The woman, Rebecca, went out there and she was watering. So, so this was a chore that women would do. But the idea was, is that many, people, many scholars believe that the women would congregate together early in the morning before the heat of the day. They would congregate together and they would, they would do this chore together. It was almost like a time of fellowship. You can see all, you know, they didn't want a whole lot to do back then, ladies, I'm just saying. Like, I, I'm not picking on ladies, I'm just saying, you know, there was a lot of, there was work to do, but it wasn't like Facebook, you know, we didn't like scroll through our Instagram and all our social media and kind of get like caught up, you know, and all of that stuff. No, there was real work to be done. We didn't have running water. We had to go fetch water from the well. The man was out in the field working, doing whatever. And so, you know, the woman had to do, had her own chores that she had to do. They were working as a team to get her done, Right? But she was by herself. The truth of the matter is, is that the decisions in her life had affected her. Jesus called her out. You can do whatever you want with it. I'm not going back. That's not really what I'm preaching about right now. But what I'm trying to say is this. She had made some obvious decisions in her life. And it appears that these decisions that she had made had ostracized her in the village that she lived in. And she was carrying that pain around. But you know what? I got good news, man. Yeah. I got good news because let me tell you something. While people may have looked at her previously and looked down on her, I'm here to tell you I got good news. Jesus knows how to reach in and to heal. Jesus knows how to tell people to get up and to walk. And Jesus knows how to speak to you and say, people may look down on you. They might not like the decisions that you made, but you are my child and I'll raise you up and I'll fill you up and I'll give you a new name and I'll give you strength to walk through it. And while they may judge you, I'm here to tell you I'm here to love you. Jesus had a conversation with her and look when that Samaritan woman was done with that deal what she did she went back to the village and she said I don't know what you thought about me before but come and see a man that knew everything about me and look she brought half that village with her and the white Bible says look the, the, the fields are white they're ready for harvest pray that we'd have laborers that was a good story right there man I, I need to preach on that again there was a woman with an issue of blood. She had that issue of blood for 12 years. And while you and I might not think about it, this woman understood the law of God. And what the law of God said, and from according to the Old Testament, was that a woman, I'm not trying to be weird, I'm just trying to preach what the Bible says. When a woman was on her menstrual cycle, she was considered unclean. Mm -hmm. She had an issue of blood. This woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. If you touched her... It was just like touching a leper. Mm -hmm. You couldn't go to the temple to worship God for seven days. Mm -hmm. This woman walked around all of her life knowing that if anyone touches me, they cannot go to temple. They cannot get into the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, wow. but yeah. mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of a weight is that to carry? Right, right. What kind of a burden is that to carry? Mm -hmm. To be ostracized from society. Do we even take the time to think sometimes what other people could be going through, what other people could be feeling? Amen. Or are we just so busy, worried about our own little situation Amen. and what we expect from other people that we never put ourselves in other people's situations? Put yourself in somebody else's situation. Allow God to put some empathy in your heart for Amen. people. That Jesus cared about people. Yes, even with the Samaritan woman, you know, I don't mean to go back to her, but the scripture, you know, I always draw that little map, but to me, it's so good. You know, my little map of Israel, this is Israel right here. Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Mediterranean here. This little, this little strip of land was Israel. And Samaria was about right here. And Judah was here. And Galilee was up here. And the Bible teaches, well, extra biblical commentaries and things of that, you can find it. I don't have time to go through it all. Why the Samaritans and the Jews, hey, the Jews, Judah, 
is where the Jew, where the Jew comes from. The Jews hated the Samaritans. I don't have time to get into what the hatred was all about. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It goes all the way back to whenever the children of Israel were disobedient and they were brought in captivity to Assyria and they repopulated the land. We don't have time to go there. But there was a deep hatred towards the Samaritans and the Jews. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that Jesus was baptizing and that John the Baptist was baptizing. And the Bible, listen, people would say, commentators talk about the fact that they hated the Samaritans so much that if somebody from Judah wanted to travel to Galilee, they would cross the Jordan. They would walk through the land of Perea. They would come back up here and come to Galilee that way. Just to avoid walking through Samaria. Every time I think of the fact of what the scripture says, it said Jesus, it says he must needs yeah. go through Samaria. Yes, yes. Lord. Mm-hmm. You know what that means? It means that the Holy Spirit was compelling Jesus to go through a place where no one else wanted to go. And when you come to the realization of where he ended up, the Holy Spirit was compelling Jesus to go through Samaria. You must go through Samaria all for one purpose. One woman that was hurting and lonely and ostracized by society that was at that well that loved her some Jesus and what what needed the love of Jesus and wanted God to do something on the inside of her heart. Maybe you're that Samaritan woman, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, and you desire for God to show up. Guess what? Jesus says, God says, he must needs go through Samaria. He will show up where you are to do the work that you need him to do. Hallelujah. And this woman right here, going back to the woman with the issue of blood, she was living that life for those 12 years. One more real quick, blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus was begging on the side of the road. Every day the same thing, people passing by. I heard a preacher one time talking about life passing you by. Blind Bartimaeus just sitting there, all the, all the traffic, all the people begging alms. He's sitting there begging alms. You know, you know, you know the, 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 the Bible, in all of these people's lives, there were outside forces that tried to prevent them from getting what they needed from God. Boy, yeah. look, let me tell you something. You just, why do you think that the enemy fights so hard? Yeah. He doesn't want you to get the freedom that God wants to give you. And he will cause all kinds of circumstances and situations and frustrations to prevent you from getting what it is that you need to get from God. Listen, in Naaman's case, it was his pride almost prevented him from getting what he needed. The prophet told it. The the Lord told the prophet, you tell him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. What did he say? Aren't the rivers of Syria far, far uh, more, more, you know, beautiful than that of, of Israel? Yeah. His pride didn't want to allow him to do what God was telling him to do. Pride will stand in the way to prevent you from bowing your knee to do what God has called you to do. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, there are people going to think whatever about Who cares what anybody thinks oh, about you? Yeah. If Jesus is going to heal you, yeah. if he's going to rise you up with wings of eagle, and if he's going to set the captive free, who cares? What the world thinks, who cares what the church thinks about you? Listen to me, folks. This has got to be a safe place. And if I, I'm telling you right now, I ain't scared to call somebody out up in the church. We ought not be making each other feel weird. We ought not be making each other feel weird just because your brother or your sister doesn't handle their business exactly the way you want them to handle your their business. Listen to me. It's their business and it's between them and the Lord. And you need to let God do a work on the inside of your heart so that you don't cause more trouble in their life and instead pray for them. See, that's what the Lord would have you to do. He'd have you to pray for them. Because... I'm not going to say it like my old preacher used to say. Well, you know, that's what he used to say. Brad, Brad used to say, because you got your own booger in your own biscuit. That's kind of good. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I get the point he was trying to make. Right, right. You got a beam in your eye, man. You're trying to get chaff out of somebody else's, and you got a beam in your own eye. Amen. Help us, Lord. In all of these people's lives, see, pride was trying to prevent Naaman from going to Washington to Jordan. The Samaritan woman, her improper understanding of the scriptures almost prevented her salvation. 
She said, when you Jews say we're supposed to worship on this mountain and we say you're supposed to worship on this mountain, Jesus says, you know not what to worship. Mm. He said, he said, true worship comes from the Jews because what he was talking about, <laughs> we can understand it now from Judah was the tribe that David would come from. From David comes Messiah. Oh. Messiah brings salvation. Yeah. Yeah. The Jews know what to worship. They might not always do what they're supposed to do, but it was written in their word. And unfortunately for you Samaritan folk, y'all left half. Y'all only followed the first five books of the Bible, so you didn't even know about King David. Right. So you living on a, on half a lot, just like most people in the church today. Come on now. I'm just I'm not picking on them. That's most good. preachers That's that stand good. behind pulpits aren't even doing it on purpose. Right. They right. just followed the traditions of their fathers before them. They go to schools that teach them how to teach. And nobody opens up the scripture from a fresh perspective and say, okay, Holy Spirit. Right. Okay, Rabboni, teach me your word. You be my teacher. Let me see the scriptures. Let the same spirit that raised you from the dead that wants to quicken my yes. mortal body speak to me. Hallelujah. Speak to me, Lord, through your scriptures and show me your truth. Let me tell you something. The same Holy Spirit will reveal the truth of the gospel. When the, whole, the same spirit, there's only one word, there's only one true word, and there's only one true spirit. And when the two of them are mixed together and they're working in unison with one another, yes. the truth of the gospel comes forth yes, and brings liberty. The woman with the issue of blood, there was a big old crowd of people that tried to prevent her from getting where she needed to go. Things hindering people, limitations, preventing people from getting where they need to go. And blind Bartimaeus, Bar, blind Bartimaeus, <laughs> I think that I'm getting confused. I bought a video when my girls were young about veggie tails. I don't remember, did it in the, I think in the video, somebody said something about buy more tomatoes or something like that. Or one of my girls thought that's what they were saying. I don't remember. But anyway, blind Bartimaeus. The disciples tried to prevent him. They said, shut up! But he cried out all the more. Hallelujah. Listen, man, when religion tries to shut you up, don't you listen to religion. You just better know you're hearing from the Lord. When you hear the voice of Jesus pass by and speak, Hallelujah. As long as you hear from the Lord and you're in God's will, you don't need to worry about what the preacher says. You don't need to worry about what nobody else said. Because guess what? Nobody else can hear for you from the Lord like you can hear from the Lord. Yes. Amen. I just, we just all got to remember <laughs> that sometimes, you know, our own heart tells us what we want to hear. But that's all of us. Every last one of us has experienced that every last one of us has made those decisions and every last one of us have had to live with some of those decisions right so we ought not be walking around here acting like we're going to be the savior for everybody to where nobody ever makes the wrong decision right lord help us to hear your voice and help us to walk according to your will and remove all those obstacles all right now we got to move on point number one when God's mercy moves. Praise God. John chapter 5 verse 2. Going back to that. It says in 5.2 and a portion of 5.3. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pole. Which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. And then in verse 3 it says that they would wait for the moving of the water. You know that word Bethesda. It actually has two meanings. One house of mercy. House of mercy and flowing water. And it was by the sheep gate where the animals that would be used for sacrifice entered into the city. Entrance into God's kingdom, entrance into the flow of God's mercy is always side by side with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You understand that? Every time you will see the moving and the operation of the Holy Spirit in a situation, God doesn't accidentally do it. He purposefully puts things, in my opinion, in his story, in his word, to show the side-by-side -side working and operation, how the Holy Spirit flows through the work of Jesus. By the sheep gate, there was a pool called mercy, mm -hmm. called the house of mercy. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Listen, even in the book of Revelation, it says there was a lamb and he had seven eyes and the seven eyes represented the spirit of God. Oh, 
a lamb that had been slain connected to the Spirit of God. What I'm trying to say is you will never extricate the work of the Holy Spirit. You will never separate the work of the Holy Spirit with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's right. Whenever you try to do that, then now you're changing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, by the sheep gate, God's mercy is like flowing water, and when it gets ready to move, the flow of its movement can't be stopped. Amen. We might be able to make a dam nowadays, but look, the flow of water, water will find its own course. When God's mercy gets ready to move, it will not be stopped. People can try to stop it. Religion can try to stop it. Society and even Satan can try to stop the move of God, but it cannot and it will not be stopped when God is ready to do a work in somebody's life. Look at Romans 8, 31 and 32. It says, what shall we say then? Say to these things, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You know, so many things trying to come against us. So many things trying to stop us. The Apostle Paul would go on and say in this passage of Scripture that he was convinced that neither angels nor principalities nor powers nor death, nothing could stand in the way and separate us from the love and the presence of God. Hallelujah. Because if it was up to some people, even people in the church, they'd try to pull you away from the love of God. Not on purpose. <laughs> But the enemy knows how to use people even in the church. Oh, yeah. You know, when I hear stories about like even down the road in a youth group setting, whenever these three or four girls go to youth group together, but then whenever they go to school, the girl, some of the girls in the youth group are part of the bullying activity towards another girl in the youth group. <laughs> Dude, that's a problem. Yes, it is. Yes. We're seeing here in this story the temporary and limited action of the moving of water in this pool, but it's being contrasted with the unlimited and never-ending power of Jesus. Jesus offers a moving and living water that never stops flowing. Amen? Y'all with me? I'm preaching long this morning. Y'all okay? We're okay? John 7, 37 through 39. Are y'all hot? No. All right. I'm going to work myself up. And <laughs> John 7, 37 through 39. We're talking about the contrast of the temporary movement of the water in that pool to the eternal, ever moving, li living water of Jesus. Amen. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spoke he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Mm. See, there's another proof text that tells us the difference after you get saved. You want to know why you were so different after you got saved? You want to know why? So whenever a true, listen, it's not the same for everybody. So don't let the devil lie to you. Right. It's not the same for everybody, but some people have such a radical conversion. At the same time, beware. We just preached on the parable of the sower last Wednesday. And in the parable of the sower, it said some seed fell on stony ground and it sprung up quickly. But then whenever the sun came out, the trials and tribulations and the persecutions of life, it began to scorch because there was no root. There had been not been time for the root to get down in the soil. Let me tell you something. The enemy will try to bring trials and persecutions against you to try to scorch the new life that is in you. But I will tell you something. I'll tell you that I'll tell you that God, amen, will do a work on the inside. And sometimes it is so radical and sometimes it is so fast that it's unbelievable. But let me tell you why it is that way. Whenever it happens like that, it's the Holy Spirit. In this passage of scripture, it says in John 7, 37 at the end, this he spoke of the spirit which them that they believe on him would receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. What Jesus was doing was he was at a feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. All right, this is an Old Testament thing. 
I'm a teacher and a preacher. See, I just got to deal with it. If you don't like teaching, you came to the wrong church. There was a feast of the tabernacles. And during this, this is one of those feasts where the men would have to travel to Jerusalem. And during this feast of tabernacles, during the time frame of Jesus, what would happen is, is that the priest would take a golden pitcher. He'd walk to the spring called the spring Gihon. He'd grab some water. He'd walk back to the altar. He'd pour the pitcher of water on the altar. And they would watch it flow down. And it reminded them of the time whenever their country men were in the wilderness and they smoked the rock or they spoke to the rock and water flowed out of the rock and with that rock G Paul told us that rock was Jesus yes. the flowing of the water yes. was the Holy Spirit amen. amen in this feast of tabernacles on the seventh day they would take seven pitchers and they would pour it and so this water is rushing down the steps of the temple and Jesus see the rabbis are sitting down because that's what they would do Jesus stood up in the midst of it all contrasting see because he's offering eternal life right. he's offering that's living good. water yeah. amen and this is just an act that they're doing Jesus stands up in the middle of all of that he's all about a ruckus stands up in the middle of all of that and he says come on to me well, look what he says right here he says he that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You see this water right here, that last trickle is about to stop. But if you will put your heart and your hope and you're loving me. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. I was the rock in the wilderness through which the water flowed. I was the light, the, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. I was all the representation of Old Testament types. I'm here to bring the fulfillment. Yeah. And if you'll put your hope and your trust in me, I will fill you up and you will have eternal life. Yeah. Living waters. I'm not trying to tell you that you're never going to have a bad day, man. Right, right. I'd be a lying preacher if I told you you never have a bad day. But listen to me, living water is there for you. The presence of God is there for you. And the closer we stay to God's will, the more that His Spirit is moving and operating in our life, the more of His truth that we will be experiencing. Jesus stood in contrast with the rabbis. And He showed that He offers something. I'm talking about when God's mercy begins to flow. That's point number one. When God's mercy begins to flow, nothing's going to stop it because it's a supernatural act of God. When he's ready to move in your life, you might have been one way one minute and the next minute you're completely different. And listen to me. Some people would say, yeah, well, that's not my story. I've seen people like that where they got saved. They were never the same. I've been coming to church. I've been loving the Lord yet at the same time I struggle. Guess what? Many times I hadn't got there yet, but we are the author of our own confusion. I'm preaching to the preacher. Many times we're the author of our own confusion. Look, point number two, when your own power is paralyzed. When your own power is paralyzed. It says in John 5, 3, In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And the impotent man, in verse 7, answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. This man's condition caused him to become paralyzed. Listen, I'm not trying to say that his spinal cord was severed, I'm trying to say he could not move. Right. His condition caused a paralysis in him. That's it. The Lord began to speak to me about this message about a week and a half ago. And what the Lord began to show me was, is that sometimes, listen, we've all been in places in our walk with the Lord where this can happen to us. Sometimes we're in such a spiritual condition that we're paralyzed. Yeah. Paralyzed to the point where we can't even make a move. Mm -hmm. We cannot even make a move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. Sometimes it just takes a whimper. Sometimes it just takes yeah. a whisper. Yeah. yeah. Where your heart means business with God. Yeah. And you say, Lord, I can't yeah. even move. I'm paralyzed. I need you to show up, Lord. I need you to show up. I need you to do a work on the inside of my heart. I need you to move and to do a work in me and to change me. The point that I'm making is that he had been physically immobilized for so long that his muscles had atrophied to the point that they had no strength. He literally could not move or help himself. You know what? Sometimes we're just lying there and we're all dried up and desperate. And we don't want to be the way that we are, but essentially we're hopeless because we're helpless. But I'm here to tell you that God has a promise. Look at Isaiah 40, verse 29. God will never leave the people that love him the way that they are. Listen, if you, and, and, unless you want to be left there, I haven't even got to that point yet. Let me make that clear. Sometimes we don't want to get rid of our paralysis. Hold on a second, preacher. Just slow down. 
He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Right. If you ain't got no might, he's willing to increase your strength. Even if you're faint and you're void of your own strength, he's willing to breathe afresh and anew on you. He's willing to give you what it is that you need. But in this passage in Isaiah, much of Israel was in captivity at this point because of her own sin. Right. And God never wants to leave the people that love him bound in captivity. Even though many times it's our own choices that lead to our own bondage. I don't mean to be goofy, but let's rewind. Even though it's our own choices that lead to our own bondage. He doesn't want to leave us that way. He will deliver for that is what he does. He's a God of deliverance. But it's important that we begin to realize. Because whenever we're raised in a church, wherever we follow the traditions of the Father, and the preacher just listens to what the preacher before him said, and the preacher before him said, then what the message that comes behind the pulpit says is this. God only knows what they sound like now. Dude, I'm just being honest. Like I have, I'm so glad I don't even listen to that. The garbage on TV, seeker-sensitive movement, church growth movement, lies from Satan, not even, even scratching the surface of the living Word of God, giving some kind of other language that just feeds the flesh or whatever it does leaves us paralyzed right, right. spiritually can't move yeah, yeah, yeah. no power a form of godliness but denying the power yes. of God yeah. no God will set the captive free but the reality of it is is that many times we find ourselves in a situation where we don't necessarily really want to be free at that moment in time mm -hmm. And, and so what, 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 many, what I'm trying to say is, is that we hadn't gotten sick and tired of being sick and tired. Hold on a second. I'm going to get to that in a second. When, when I, and what I'm, try, what I'm trying to say is, is that many times they're preaching, if they even talk about failure. Sometimes they won't even mention the word sin because it offends people to say sin. It offends people for some reason to say blood. It offends people to imagine a dying Savior naked on a cross because of their sin that put him there. Right. But we're all born in sin if we don't hear the truth of the of our deliver what it, the cost that it paid for our deliverance then we're then we're missing the point. And instead, what many times at least the churches that I grew up in it was a works based message that said, "Oh, the reason that you're not free in this area of your life is because you don't read enough of the Bible." Right. Right. You don't go to church enough. You're not involved in enough ministry. You don't, you don't get involved in this. You don't fast enough. You don't pray in tongues enough. You don't do enough. It's a spirit of control from the pulpit, a spirit of religion that puts the weight on the people and causes them to feel like they're in a never-ending, burdensome trial that's their own fault and that they can never break free and they lie there paralyzed like this infirm man for 38 years. But I'm here to tell you that that's not how God operates. That's not the word of the living God. The word of the living God says that you were paralyzed and that you were hopeless and that you were helpless, but that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that he could do for you what you could not do for yourself and he took your sin upon him and he bore it on Calvary's tree and the great exchange took place and he took your sin and he gave you as a gift his righteousness and now because of your right standing with the Father the Holy Spirit can flow in your life Yes. Rivers of living water bringing healing. Rivers of living water doing things for you that no doctor could ever do. That no daddy could ever do. That no matter how much somebody loved you that he could never do. Because God in one moment of time yes. with one word yes. in his presence yes. can bring healing. Man, let me tell you something. I know I've been going long. I'm a long winded preacher, man. That's just another thing, dude. That might be why, if y'all get rid of me, that'll probably be why. But listen, I'm not going to apologize. I got something to say. I can remember whenever, back in the day, whenever the Lord was working in my life after my sister had died, I didn't even know what to do. I didn't know how to worship the Lord. I'd been a Christian for 12 years. I never really even tapped in, man. 
I had never even really tapped in. And the Lord began to wake, tell me, he said, seek me early and you will find me. But I'm not a morning person. Okay, good, you little rebel, go back to sleep. <laughs> I, that's how God will speak to me. He might not speak to you like that. But I, I mean, look, I, sometimes I hear, my, I sound kind of like my old daddy did. All right, you little rebel, you little stiff neck, just lay in the bed. But he's not really like that, you know that? Amen. God's yeah. soft, man. But he can be firm. <clears throat> Amen. Get up and seek me. When you seek me, you will find me. I can remember that morning when I finally woke up. And I, man, like, I don't even like that church. I'm not even going to tell you who it is. But they had a CD, dude. And they, they had that. What did you sing when you got up here? Open the floodgates of heaven. That song. How many years ago was that? I don't even like the church that that, that, that song came out of. I'm not going to tell you. I'm just telling you. It's, it's in Louisiana. That song. Well, that was Michael W. Smith's song, right? I think so. Michael W. Smith's song, but they redid it on that CD. And I had that CD play. Open the floodgates of heaven, let it rain. Dude, for the first time in my life. I can remember saying this. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but I can remember saying, God, I hope she's with you. And if she's with you, I'm talking about my sister. Tell her that I loved her like I never said it myself. And when I said that, dude. Oh, it was like heaven broke open. Yeah. Like a deluge of grace fell on me. But let me tell you what happened, dude. This is so interesting to me. It was like as I was, I was on my knees in the middle of my living room and tears were just streaming down my face. I was experiencing the presence of God, a download from the Lord like I've never experienced before. But all of a sudden, it was like in my mind's eye, there were flashes of my life. Not so much before Christ, but after Christ. All the failures. Look, look, only God can do this, man. I'm telling you, if I tried to get up here and do it, I'd mess it all up because I'd make you feel bad about yourself. But only God, the Holy Spirit, can do something such as this where he would show you all of your failures, all of your sin, and all of the problems that it's even caused to his kingdom. And instead of weighting you down with condemnation, instead... Fill you up with his spirit and say, but I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make you whole. I'm going to heal you if you'll just trust me yes. and hope yes. in me. Yes. Many times, I just got to tell you that God doesn't want to leave us the way that we were. God wants to do a work in our lives. Amen. I've experienced and I know that it's real. And while I maybe haven't walked in it the way that I was supposed to each and every day since that day that he touched me, no one will ever convince me that it's not real. No one will ever convince me that the word of God doesn't work. No one will ever convince me that the work that Jesus performed at Calvary was not enough when he said it is finished and he gave up the, the Holy Spirit that was in him. The veil from the temple was ripped from top to bottom and signifying that entrance into the Holy of Holies was now made available for every human being. Yeah. You can enter into the presence of God in your living room, on your own, just you and Jesus, and you can let God heal you. I think what I was trying to say is this, is one moment. Yeah. One moment with the master yes. can accomplish something in your life. Yes. Yeah. Man, Jesus wow. paid such a high price for you to be able to access the presence of God. For me to be able to access the presence of God, I don't know about you, but I think we need to start trying to access. We get so caught up in this life, so worried about, look, I, I, I preach to the preacher, man. So worried about the way we look. I like my groovy new little haircut. But you know what? That's all a bunch of silliness, man. If we're so caught up in all of that, that we, that we, can't, that we can't see what's important in this life, a bunch of silliness, man. A bunch of stuff that's going to burn up. A bunch of stuff that ain't going to last. Yeah. It's about kingdom business. Lord, help yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Help us to stay focused. Point number three. I need to hurry up. I'm keeping y'all too long. But will you let him heal you? John 5, 6. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he says unto him, will you be made whole? Jesus knew that this man had been in this condition for a really long time. And I wanted you to say, I want to say it again. I said it earlier. He knows where you are. He knows every step that you've taken. He knows what's going on in your life. He's not taken by surprise when there's things going on in your life and you don't know how you're going to get out of the situation or you don't know how it's going to end. God knows what you're going through. Amen. 
And your question that he's asking is, will you be made whole? Will you let Jesus heal you? Will you let him set you free from your bondage? Yes. This is the question that I had in here. I didn't want to get ahead of myself. Or are you still in a place where your bondage doesn't seem yet like a paralyzing prison? Hmm. See, there's sometimes our bondage doesn't seem like a paralyzing <laughs> prison. We're just not convinced yet. I don't know. It don't seem like it's all that bad. I can still tolerate it a little bit. Let me tell you something. You just continue to live in that bondage. You continue to live there. Sooner or later, man, that door is going to be slammed. So look, don't let the devil lie to you. Sometimes it's just about taking a little turn in the right direction. Just come on. Just whisper to the Lord. Lord, I need your help. And start turning in the right direction. And start moving in the right direction. Every time we want something outside of God's will, it's because we're deceived. Incapable of seeing God's truth clearly. I'm kind of switching gears here. I'm not trying to say exactly what this man's deception was. I'm just trying to make a point. I'm, I'm trying to make a point that sometimes we're okay with the bondage that we're in. And I'm trying to make a point that when we're okay with the bondage that we're in, it's because of deception. It's because we're deceived and incapable of seeing God's truth clearly. And as long as we're deceived and okay with the bondage, we will stay right there paralyzed. That's, that's one of the points that I wanted to try to make. It's not because you don't read your Bible enough. It's not because you don't quote scripture enough. It's not because, no, sometimes whenever we find ourselves in the same place where we've been and we're not seeing the freedom. Oh, man, that preacher over there, boy, he gets so fired up. The veins poke out of his head. But guess what? I still find myself in bondage. Hello, honey. Let me just say a word. It ain't God's word. That's the problem. It ain't God's word that's the problem and it's not the finished work of Jesus that's the problem. If there's a problem that plagues our life and is including the preacher too, it's because we continue to allow the bondage in our life. The Lord, His will works. His word works. Word of God in Matthew chapter 16, it says that Peter rebuked Jesus. The, the Bible says that Jesus began to explain to them that he was going to Jerusalem and that he was going to have to suffer many things at the hand of the religious leaders and that he'd be crucified and that he'd be resurrected on the third day. And you know what Peter said? Not so, Lord, this not be for you. Hmm. You know what the Lord told him? Get behind me, Satan. I rebuke you, Satan, for you savor not the things of God, but you savor the things of men. Hmm. Yes. Wow. See, Peter's... Motivation was all messed up. Yeah. Peter wanted what he wanted. Oh, I want my Jesus. But I want it in the little package that I wanted it. <laughs> See, I want Jesus to lead an army that we defeat Rome. And he sits on the throne as the son of David. And I'm right there by his side. Yeah. And Israel gets her glory like the Lord said we would get it again in the Old Testament. Peter was deceived. Guess what, Peter? He's right there, amen. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, the Bible doesn't say he's at the pearly gates or whatever. It doesn't say that, but but he's there now. He he sees the Lord one day. He's gonna have his glorified body just like Jesus too, and he'll be standing right there. He's got a special place in heaven, and amen. But it ain't gonna be the way you envision it, Peter. Every time we want something outside of God's will is because we're deceived and incapable of seeing God's truth clearly. Peter is confused. He's deceived and blinded by the lust of his own heart. He doesn't want Jesus to die because, once again, he wants it to be the way he wants it. You know, God's plan, can I say this? I'm getting close to the end. Y'all bear with me. We're about to go eat crawfish, man. It sounds like the weather's getting better. <laughs> hey, God's plan is to make Peter, I'm sorry, God's plan is not to make Peter temporarily happy. Right, right. Like, oh, but I want to be happy. What? If you would have hear, heard me teach on the Beatitudes, that word Beatitude in the Greek language describes a happiness that doesn't come from <coughs> external sources. Wow. It comes, it comes, it, it describes a happiness and a joy that can only come from the flow of the Lord. Yeah. God's plan is to make Peter temporarily ha happy God's plan is to save the world from their sin yes. Amen. we might get deceived and confused sometimes in the circumstances of life because we want to be happy but Jesus is <laughs> never confused okay. he speaks to the heart of the problem and he says get behind me Satan Peter's not Satan 
Peter's right. being deceived by Satan. Right. Right. In the name of Jesus, anything in our life that's causing deception, yeah. get behind us, Satan. Jesus says, will you be made whole? Or, I'm asking, is the making of you being whole contrary to the plans that you have made in your own heart and mind? I'm not going to let go of that because that's a good word right there for us to be reminded time and again. Don't you, don't me, don't us blame the word. Don't let us blame the plan. Don't let us blame the work of Jesus when things don't go the way that we want them to go. But instead, let us be reminded that we have our own will. We have our own flesh. And many times it's contrary to the inner working of the plan of God in our life and when we continue to move that way instead of opening up the floodgates of heaven and letting it rain instead we're opening up a door I don't have to go do it again do I <laughs> opening up a door and Satan put his foot up in there and he's trying to squirt, squirm and wiggle his way up in there he doesn't give up easy he's going to continue to try to hold on listen but I want you to know this is my last point right here alright you ready? John 5, 8. Last point, point number four, a new testimony. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Boy, did I preach that long again? I did. But you know what? I don't even care. I don't preach as long as I want. Preach as long as I want. I'm good. I'm happy. I'm good. <laughs> John 5, 8. Y'all bear with me. The church is paying for y'all's crawfish today. <laughs> That's why y'all showed up. No, nah, I'm just joking. All right, y'all hang in there, man. I, hey, look, the Lord done said some good stuff today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do what you want with it. Be happy about it. Be sad about it. <laughs> a new testimony. Do you want a new testimony? I want a new testimony. Yeah, yeah. John 5, 8. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Yeah. You know, in the story of blind Bartimaeus, if you go back and you read it, you know what the Bible says? He threw his garment to the side. Hmm. The scholars say that in those times in ancient Jeru in, the, in the ancient Israel and ancient Jerusalem, during those time frames, they, they were given a beggar's garment. People that begged were given a garment. It was almost like a status in society, and it allowed them the permission from the government to sit there and to beg. And whenever blind Bartimaeus <coughs> saw, got, had an option, what he did? He threw that old life to the side. He threw that old life to the side so that he could grab the new life, Jesus, that was walking by. Because sometimes we're trying to hold on. I don't even know what this is, but we're trying to hold on to all this stuff that we came from our own life. But you got to let go so that you can grab a hold of Jesus. And many times, thank you, Lord, many times we don't want to let go of what we had before. Blind Bartimaeus said, nope. Chucking that stuff to the side so that I can grab a hold of the new life yes. that God has given me. Amen. Amen. You know, in the story of the lame man, Jesus told him to pick up his bed and walk. And I see a beautiful contrast. No, a beautiful truth. New Testament truth in both of these stories. Because, see, the throwing of Bartimaeus' garment to the side. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. I'm closing. Y'all just bear with me. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says this, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. What the scripture is saying is that the old man that was born of Adam died with Jesus. And at some point in time, just like Bartimaeus' garment, he needs to be thrown to the side of that somebody's notebook, I'm sorry. <laughs> he needs to be thrown to the side. The old man, the old ways, the old life needs to be thrown. The beggar's garment needs to be thrown to the side. I'm not that person anymore. Amen. That old man died in Christ. What did your old person look like? Oh, yeah, but preacher, I ain't like I used to be, man. If you would have known me before, I was so jacked up. Listen, we ain't over here talking about relative righteousness. We talking about we either walking towards Jesus or we're, we're back. We're like a backsliding heifer that, Jesus, that, that the book of Hosea talked about a couple of weeks ago. Right, right. That's good that that was you. <laughs> She's always looking at everybody else when they make boy. <laughs> With you, Lord. I, just, I like to pick on 
Okay. All right. So what I'm trying to say is that throwing of, throwing of the garment aside represents throwing away the old life so that we can grab a hold of the new life. The old life is gone. The old man is dead. Let go of those things of the past that keep you tied to it. Come on, get up, get up, and leave it right there on the ground. God has something better for you, but you have to let go of the one before you can grab a hold of the other. Amen. Gotta let go, man. Alright. At the same time, Jesus said, pick up your bed and walk. Look at this scripture right here. I'm closing right here, I promise. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And I used this recently, but look, it says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. It's kind of like, you know, I, I know I talk about that word sanctify a lot. It means to be made holy, but it also means to separate out. And it's kind of like there's supposed to be this, well, I probably shouldn't even put it right there. I need to put it right there, smack dab in the middle. It's like there needs to be a spot right there, a separate spot, a special place for Jesus in your heart. If Jesus is sanctified out in your heart, then all that other stuff is going to be moved out. Right. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And look at this. I like this part right here. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of the reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. This is how I wrote it in my thing. Dude, why do you love Jesus so much? What I'm trying to say is, is that when the Lord grabs a hold of you and you sanctify him in your heart, then all of a sudden the Spirit of God, because he set you free, you used to be infirm for 38 years. You were laying down and you couldn't move. You were paralyzed. Your poison had paralyzed you. But then Jesus showed up and said, will you be made whole? Get up, stand up, pick up your bed and walk. It doesn't matter what religion says. When God shows up and sets the captive free, pick up your bed and walk. Dude, why do you love Jesus so much? Because you don't even know who I used to be. You don't know where I was. I was laid down in an for 38 years. Couldn't even roll myself over to get up in that pool. I was so messed up. But Jesus showed up and he set me free. Now I got him in a special place in my heart. And I'm really excited. And when the door opens and the opportunity arrives, I just got to tell somebody yes. Yes. about the Jesus that set me free. Yes. Always be ready to give somebody. See, that's the difference, man. The old man died and you need to throw that garment to the side, but pick up your bed and walk. See, you got a new testimony. Yes. Ever be reminded of what the Lord brought you from. Amen. Amen. Don't let, don't carry it around on your back like a burden, like you're still that person. No, throw that to the side, but always remember what the Lord delivered you from. It's your testimony, man. God wants to set you free and he wants to use you.